So before I talk, you know, about my topic, let me, you know, let me come back to the uh, introduction, actually. So what is a physician scientist? So, you know, maybe let me just introduce what I'm actually doing. So um, as you heard, I work at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, um, where we basically do basic research. So we're trying to develop in the laboratory novel treatment options for patients with liver cancer. And we are also testing these new ideas and conduct clinical trials. So this is really, um, you know, this really allows me um, to go from very basic questions and then translate these into patients and, and, and develop novel treatments and test those. And at the uh, NIH or the NCI, we, we, we have a unique opportunity to do this. And um, I would like to get back to this poll that we just had. And the unique opportunity that we have is that we can basically treat anybody. There is no costs for our patients. There is no transportation issues. We can fly in patients if they come to our trials. And I think this is you know, quite a unique um, opportunity for patients that I want them to be aware of. Now, you, you just heard from Renew about you know, the different clinical trials and the different stages. But you know, what I would like to do is, you know, let's just go one step back from the patient perspective. And the first question obviously is, should I enroll into a clinical trial or not? And when? When is the right time? And this is obviously, you know, a very important question. And the answer is, you know, this is something that you have to discuss with your treating physician. There are clinical trials for patients that are just newly diagnosed. Obviously, this, in this case, you would uh, discuss the trial before you have even started any type of treatment. But then there is also clinical trials for those patients that have already received one type of treatment and this treatment was maybe not as effective as it should have been or it was not very well tolerated. So that's another option when you can potentially enroll into a clinical trial. Sometimes I get calls or emails from patients and they ask, you know, maybe, you know, should I enroll into a clinical trial? And, you know, we just discuss this as an option for future treatments in case the current treatment is not applicable or, or, or no longer um, working. So the short answer again, you know, is when is it right time for a clinical trial? You know, it really depends on the patient as well as the type of trial. Now, how do clinical trials actually work? And, you know, the, the idea is, you know, to talk about novel drugs and, you know, what we see in the future. And here, I have to tell you, I've been working in this area for way too many years. Um, the field has really dramatically changed. I still remember together with my uh, um, good friend, uh, Dr. Abu Alfa, you know, that we had very few drug options available for patients. And now, we actually have a battery of different drugs, and this is the result of clinical research and doing clinical trials. So from a broad perspective, when we talk about clinical trials and novel treatment options, what we do right now is always the best, and the clinical trials are there to develop novel treatments which, are, which have to be basically better than what we have right now. So let me explain to you what I mean by this. So current treatment, and you've heard this from the previous speakers, include surgical treatments, they include interventional treatments, and they include systemic treatments and radiation therapy. These are basically the main pillars that we have. And when we talk about systemic treatments, you heard about this, there is, um, uh, what we call TKIs or, or um, targeting drugs, and then the growing field of immunotherapy that really has um, brought significant changes to the field and, 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 um, and advanced the field. So when we talk now about novel treatments, the first thing one can do is one can use these novel, these treatments that maybe are only approved for patients with already advanced or metastatic disease. 
And we can test them in, in other settings, in earlier settings, for instance, in the adjuvant setting. You've heard about adjuvant earlier today. So this is type of a trial where you already use drugs that are approved in HCC, not for a specific tumor stage. And we try to see that something that works maybe in a later tumor stage also works in an earlier tumor stage or, for instance, in combination with an already established treatment. The established treatment could be a radiofrequency ablation, or it could be a transarterial chemoembolization or taste procedure, or it could also be radiation treatment. Now, these are treatments or clinical trials which basically use drugs that are already that have already shown efficacy in HCC, and which are already approved by the FDA. Now, the next level of novelty are drugs which have not received FDA approval in HCC. These may be drugs that we use, use in other indications, maybe other to, uh, tumors of the GI tract, and um, such drugs um, do exist and are being uh, studied right now. And the question is that um, a researcher then you know, asks is, could it be that these drugs also are effective in HCC? Now let's get more um, progressive. And those are the studies where we actually test novel drugs which have not received FDA approval. So these drugs are not um, on the market yet. And these drugs are tested in patients with HCC. So how do we do this? So these are basically clinical trials that you offer to patients. Because we don't know how well these drugs work, we always have to keep in mind that we don't withhold a treatment that is effective. So in most cases, these treatments are offered to patients that have already received prior treatment. And we deliver this to patients. And basically, the treatment is very similar to what you experience if you have a standard treatment. So you get the treatment, you have scans before and after, and there's a team you know, that asks you how you're doing, and they're doing blood tests, et cetera. And we see how well this treatment works. Now, what are these treatments? Currently, the biggest interest is in immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, you've already heard this earlier, is basically a way to activate your immune system. We can do this in many ways. We know that the immune system can be used or can be very effective because if an immune system actually overshoots, there are, are autoimmune diseases, for instance, Crohn's disease, or you may have heard of ulcerative colitis. So we know this can be very um, effective. And the immunotherapies that we use right now are basically treatments that try to enhance T cell responses, T lymphocyte responses that basically kill your tumors. Now, the immune system is a very, very complex system in your body. It has to be complex because it prevents you from getting sick or you, when you get infections. If we didn't have a functioning immune system, any infection could potentially be deadly. And you know, I don't want to go there, but you know, we all know from the past two years how dangerous different infections can potentially be. In order for the immune system to be effective, there are various types of the immune cells. There are T cells, but there's also B cells. You may have heard of macrophages. These are basically um, cells that eat uh, specific, um, 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 basically trash um, in, in the body and, and prevent um, this trash to harm you. And currently there are a number of studies, including of HCC, where we now not only try to activate T lymphocytes, but where we also try to aim at these other cells and make these other cells more effective to basically mount a better immune response. Alternatively, to trials where we use drugs to make your immune cells really fit and destroy tumor cells, there's also the option to actually take the T cells out of your body, genetically engineer them. So we change them in the laboratory, perform kind of a gene therapy in these cells, 
make these cells fit to kill a tumor cell. We grow them so that we get enough of those cells and then transfuse them back into the patient. And this is an approach that you may have heard. It was already uh, briefly mentioned earlier today, which is called the CAR T cell approach. So this is an approach which is obviously more invasive, but it's actually only a one-time procedure. It will also require that the patient will undergo chemotherapy for three days or two to five days prior to, to the treatment. And it's certainly something which is already way more I would say novel and, 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 and um, then treatments using an immune checkpoint inhibitor that we try to improve, for instance. So what I'm trying to tell you with these clinical trials is that it's, it's really, and this is why you know, it's important to discuss this with the patient and your, your providers and, and, and your family. You know, are you going into a clinical trial that is using already established drugs where we have no, where we already have more knowledge? Or are we going into something that is more novel and something that, for instance, has never been tested in human? These are the trials that we call the first in human clinical trials. So this is all of a sudden, somebody has a brilliant idea and a good um, data suggesting that you could use a completely novel approach that has never been tested in patients with HCC. What are other treatment options? So you already heard from me now that there are treatment options where we combine immunotherapy with already conventional um, treatments. There are treatments where we make the T cells more active, maybe not only using one drug, but maybe using two drugs and two different types of drugs that aim at the T cells. The next level would be combinations where we, for instance, try to activate the tumor cell and at the same time try to activate or get rid of immune cells that actually inhibit immune responses. The, end, the, the, the body has just naturally actually also immune cells which try to prevent an overreacting immune response. But sometimes these immune cells can actually be not very good for the patients with the cancer because they kind of make your immune response too weak. The next step, as I said, would be instead of using drugs to activate your T cells, to take the T cells out of the body, genetically engineer them, and then bring them back into the body so that they can take the job and kill the tumor cells. The interesting thing is that these T cells are actually obviously cells. So they are living, living cells which remain in your body for a long time and they proliferate. And we know from early studies in in other indications that these cells can actually survive for many, many, many years. 10 years after an infusion, you can still find um, such um, CAR T cells. Now, we can go even further. So there is a lot of interest in something that we call the gut microbiome. And some of you may have heard about this. And I'm sure many haven't heard about this. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. It is well known that the human body under normal conditions, so this is not under any, this is not a disease, is carrying a lot, a lot of bacteria. You have bacteria on your skin, on your face, in your mouth, but you also have it, a lot of bacteria in your GI tract. And these bacteria help you, you need these. If you didn't have any bacteria, for instance, in your GI tract, the immune system would not be working as well as it is. Now, sometimes the compositions of these bacteria is not ideal. And we can potentially change this to make a treatment more effective and make your immune responses that we are trying to induce to kill tumors more effective. So these are um, um, different approaches and you know, without going into the details how this works, but if you really want to say, you know, where do I see the field moving in the next couple of years, this is certainly something of, of um, great interest. Now, last but not least, I want to come back 
to our standard treatments. And again, you already heard this actually in, in the um, talk just before me, where we were talking about observational studies. Now, even in what we call standard treatment or approved treatment. So this is a type of treatment where your uh, oncologist would say, you know, this is the best treatment we have and we know this works best. Unfortunately, we never know if this treatment works in every single patient. We know if we treat enough patients and compare the treatment in one group versus a different treatment or no treatment in another group, we know that the treatment group is doing better. But this is only if we look at the average of all those patients. If we look at every single individual patients, we don't know this. And what we would love to do is we would actually love to have a treatment where we know exactly if we can help every single individual patients with this or not. And that's basically something where we talk about biomarkers. The idea here is that we use different mechanisms. For instance, we look at your biopsy, we look at blood tests, we look at other um, parameters, which will help us to find a personalized approach for every single patient, which would allow us to predict that every single patient is actually responding to a treatment. So why am I mentioning this in this uh, session? Because this is also actually part of a clinical trial. So sometimes you may be uh, asked by your treating physician to enroll into a clinical trial where we collect different types of information. It can be just your clinical information. It can be data from your scans. It can be blood samples. It can be tumor samples. And the reason why this is done is because we are trying to understand the biology of the disease. And most importantly, we're trying actually to identify how specific treatments work and how we can make sure that patients, that really all patients benefit from a treatment. And it's not only the average patient, because the problem with the average patient and the approach that we're taking currently is that there are always some patients in between that are being exposed to a treatment with potential side effects and costs who unfortunately don't gain the benefit that we're wishing for. So with this, um, I would like um, to close. I hope I was able to give you a little bit about an idea where the field works. On purpose, I didn't want to confuse you and talk about specific drugs. I think this would be uh, probably too difficult at this point, but more give you a perspective. If there are any questions, I'm happy you know, to answer these in the discussion. If you don't want to do this now, you can always reach me. I work for the NIH, which gives you the advantage. You just have to put my name in Google and you'll find all the information how you can reach me with one click.